talked about what we were doing, and we wouldn't have wanted to do what we did if it weren't for those friends. And so that was, the, that was the start of a partnership, but it wasn't the start of the Apple that you know today. Turns out that before we ever shipped this product called the Apple One computer, and it was kind of, kind of weak, you would type on a screen, it was a, the only affordable one there was though, that could do a real, run real programs that you programmed. You could solve problems with it. But you would type on it, and on a black and white screen, it would have letters, and they would print out kind of slowly. And it was just, I, I built it to get into the business real quick. But before we ever shipped the single Apple I, we had the beautiful computer, the Apple II. This one had my color idea in, where you could generate color on an American television for $1. And it had graphics built in. Never before had the video terminal that you're watching on a TV screen been the computer itself. In the past, the video screen was always connected with a wire, a slow wire, and you could send letters to it, and it could print letters across a screen slowly. I made it one and the same. The computer was the video. The, the processor, the microprocessor in a computer, can change, can run a million things a second. How many can a human being do? Today, our microprocessors easily do a billion things a second. But back then, it was a million things a second. You could change a million numbers in memory every second. And my little clever idea, every number in memory came out directly, it was on the TV set. That meant you could change the colors a million per second of dots on your TV. Oh my goodness, you can make things move. You can make animations, you can make video games, you can make cartoons. Back in those days, the big games in the arcades, the big game machines, none of them even used microprocessors. None of them were software. This machine was the transition to where computers would program games and games would become software. But we had the Apple II and we knew it was so big that we had to raise money. We knew that we could sell a thousand a month of this hot computer. We only sold a little over a hundred Apple Ones ever. This new computer would sell a thousand a month. How do you build a thousand a month when you have no money? And so what we did was we went out trying to get companies to buy into this, to buy the product, give us money, and let us run the project and have stock and all that, and they turned us down. We went to venture capital seeking the money that we needed about $250,000 to build a thousand computers. And venture capital turned us down because we were young. We were in our young 20s. We had never taken business courses. We'd never been in business. We didn't know how to speak the business talk. And so venture capital turned us down, but we found an angel, a Silicon Valley investor who had made it rich working in engineering and then working in marketing. And he had made it rich and retired from the rat race. He was young. Mike Markula was his name. And he thought that we had something that was gonna be one of those things that happens maybe once a decade on the average. A whole new category of product comes about and a company can grow from zero to a billion dollars in just five years. That was how he talked to us. And well, I, I, didn't, I thought these numbers are too huge. I mean, you know, any number that huge, I can't believe it. And, but he knows what he's talking about, so I'll let him talk. You know, he's accomplished, he is successful. And Mike Markle was willing to put in the money. I was a holdout at first because I loved Hewlett Packard so much. I said, I, I don't want to leave Hewlett Packard. In one year, I had designed two computers. I had written a complete computer programming language, basic. I had designed mass storage on the cassette tapes, which were free to me because everybody has a tape, had a cassette tape player. I had done all this software and I said, I'll just keep working at night. While I work at Hewlett Packard in the daytime, I'll keep doing Apple at night, and our investors said no. And it was tough, so at first I said I don't want to do it, and then finally I convinced myself that I could start a company. Why do you start a company? Well, you start a company to make money, to get rich. And I did not want to go into management. I loved science so much. I loved technology. I loved engineering. I loved creating products out of chips that never existed, turning dreams into reality. And I loved writing software programs that did the same thing. And I could do that all my life. I don't need a company to do it. But finally, and I didn't want to move up into business because then you, don't, you, you miss out on the fun of being in the laboratory doing it yourself. Well, finally I convinced myself we could start, I could start Apple 
and I would remain an engineer forever at Apple. That's all I wanted to be. And I'll let other people be the business and run things and make decisions and be in the magazine covers and all that. I will do my engineering because nobody can do it better than me. And that was when we started Apple. So that was how we got started. Well, um, thanks for sharing the story with us. That's yes, there's lots amazing. more though coming. <laughs> uh, well, Mr. Walls, the thing is that listening to this story, there there's must be some moments in your life where you could have given up, you could have just stopped, or the ups and downs that you go through through such partnership makes you realize the importance of finding the other person that complements what you do. We've got lots of entrepreneurs in this room, we've got a lot of young engineers in this room, and I believe they would definitely be inspired by this story, but we would like to know the, the human side of was starting from uh -huh. pre-Apple yes. all the way to today. Okay, well, human side is, I really wanted um, to help make products that would make life easier. So people didn't have to work as hard, didn't have to think as hard. Um, Steve Jobs, when we started Apple Computer, we said, you know what, we're gonna build products that are really gonna help people become more of a master of their own lives, to make more decisions, to have more responsibility with these little tools and be able to solve problems and we're gonna make it a better, better world. And you always have to start a company with some thinking that what we are doing is good. It's good for people, it's good for the world. Yeah, we, we really weren't focused just on ourselves. Um, I was a strange case. All my life, I was so advanced in mathematics, the sciences, engineering, electronics, computers. I knew it all, and I never had to worry about getting a job in life. I never had to go to university to get a job. I never thought, what am I gonna do when I graduate? I was always gonna be in electronics. It was very easy for me. I was um, one of those exceptionally skilled people. Steve was more like other people searching for what they're gonna do. And then there's a different group that goes to the university and wonders, what am I gonna do when I get out? I'm graduating in psychology and I don't know where the jobs are. Um, so, so there's many kinds of people, but I had it easy. All my life, almost no obstacles ever. Whenever I thought of building some project, wow, I sat down and I knew how to do it. A few times I took on challenges that were probably impossible. Um, there was a time that I developed a floppy disk for Apple. And a floppy disk has to write data onto a disk that's like a spinning magnetic tape. You write data onto it and you read the data back. And I, was, I got to where I could write ones and zeros on the disk and I could read ones and zeros back correctly but I didn't think I'd ever be able to figure out where the starting and stopping points were. I didn't think there was a method. I hadn't figured that far ahead. And luckily, I figured one out. Um, I was very lucky. In all the early Apple days, project after project, the computers, boards that plugged into the computer that ran printers, boards that plugged into the computer that ran sensory information. Actually, we sold a lot of products that, were, that sensed oil reserves around the world and in, even in this part of the world. I actually designed an Arab version of the Apple because I just love designing things so much. A guy walked into my office and he said, would you make a version that's in Arabic? And I said, I'd love to, what do I have to do? And he showed me the character set and I burned new characters for the television, the, 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 the thing that puts it out to the TV. And then I, had, I wrote, rewrote the software so instead of going left to right, it would go from right to left. And, and some, some words, if you had a certain character at the end, it had to extend the word and have a little appendage to the character at the end. And, and it was a lot of fun. And then the, the numbers had to go still left to right. So I did that. I, I was proud of that. And we called it the Air Apple. And it was an Apple II in Arabic. And it was sold, a lot of more sold in Saudi Arabia. But I also did a European version. I loved going into the laboratory and designing things because I knew how. And I forget what topic I was on now. <laughs> Well, uh, let's go back Everything's interesting. To Everything's so interesting. Well, absolutely. It's, it's something to learn from, definitely. Oh, yes, an obstacle. I, anyway, I did solve the one with the floppy disk. So I was able to read the data and figure out where did the bytes start and where did they stop. And whew, I was so happy. Um, I was lucky. I hit a lot of, lot of luck and a lot of A-plus projects. What makes things like a, a computer, whether it's the original Apple II, the original personal computer, or a modern computer possible? Well, what, what does the iPhone have in common with the Apple II? At the time of the Apple II, 
the parts that it was made out of. Just luckily, the speed of the memory chips, the speed of the microprocessor, the cost of the memory chips, the ability to put video onto a television set, the price of keyboards, everything converged and came down to an arrangement where you could make a full product that was affordable. Now, what made the iPhone possible? Well, more than anything else, the iPhone was the first machine to say, we're just going to have a plain flat screen. Yes, there had been a couple projects like the Sony Clie that did it for watching movies, but not as a computer in your hand. The iPhone said a computer in your hand, a touch screen, but it's a multi-touch screen. You can actually spread things up. We had editing systems and all that, but it was based on the cost of that type of screen coming down in price and finally being affordable. With all of our computers, it's usually we were waiting for Moore's Law says the price of chips gets less and less and less every year for the same amount of chips, of smartness in your computer. And so the memory chips coming down and down and down in price hit the year when we started Apple, made a useful computer affordable for the first time ever. And I was just, it was just lucky when things happen all, you know, like serendipity. They're all, all the things are happening exactly right. Um, as a designer, I was really pleased by what the rest of the world was doing. Well, actually, we had this discussion before. When you said I was lucky, I said you were prepared at the right moment. So yes, yeah, because you, you, know, you need a lot of um, ideas. But I was so prepared that I was going to build that computer for myself that year. Once, once I saw the formula and that the parts were available, I was going to build it no matter what. Not knowing, you know, it just turned out it was the right time in history that uh, millions of people in the world were going to eventually want these things. Yeah, so it was very lucky to have a huge success attributed to me. All I wanted was a computer that I could write programs to solve problems for the rest of my life. The day I had my first computer built for myself, I, was, I had it made for life. Because until then, I was working at Hewlett Packard. And of course, we engineers had to write programs on computers to do our engineering. But we shared one big Hewlett Packard computer. We signed up on a sheet for who would have it this hour, who would have it the next hour. We took turns on the Hewlett Packard computer. Now I had my own machine. I brought it in and sat it down on my desk at Hewlett Packard, and I wrote programs to help me design my products, to do my what's called simulations of them. And all of a sudden, I didn't even need to use somebody else's machine, and I felt so empowered. And I wanted to bring that to everybody in the world. Well, absolutely you did. And this is why you're here in Kuwait. You've actually brought our personal computers to our pockets. Thank you. Yes. And it's funny. We have, you're told that we have a billion times as much computer in our pocket today as we had when I was in high school, as existed in the world. And it's actually partly true, but most of, mostly it's not a computer. We're told that our phones, our smartphones, are computers. And they could be computers. But a computer is a device you sit down at that solves things for you. It turns out that most of, most of our smartphones are displaying things that, where the information is coming from the internet, whether it's email or Facebook, web pages. And the, the real computing work of analyzing, grabbing information off of hard disk, putting it in a form that we can see it, is really being done in the data centers the invisible part of the internet, the cloud. It's all happening out there, and we're just sort of seeing a viewport to it now. The device isn't a computer. You can't write a program on an iPad, you know, write your own program. We don't allow a programming language, so you can't really solve your own problems uh, with it. It's, it's not a computer like when we started. Well, uh, before we move into, t into the technology uh, topic, um, I'd like to pick on the thought when you said at the early stages of your life, you really liked to play around with electronics and you had access to electronics. Now, do you believe that a, the brain is just like any other um, element that needs to be fit and you have to gradually train your brain in order for it to get the sense of the logic and start solving puzzles from time to time? Is that an important thing for all the parents in the room do they consider something like that for the young children? Absolutely. For example, um, I, I talked about how I could, by high school, when I was 16, 17 years old, I could design any computer in the world in two days. If you gave me a description of the computer, I could design it in two days. But you know, not really. I really designed it in 10 years. 
10 years of building projects that went up and up and up the ladder of learning. When you build your own projects, you always learn more and your brain learns more as you go along. So preparedness was a big, a big lucky thing that I had in my life. I had prepared myself though, it, nobody told me to do it. No parents really knew I was doing it. No friends did it. No schools gave me grades for doing it. I just did it because to me it was kind of like learning this little ones and zero stuff was like a type of puzzle. It's like if you sat there and put jigsaw puzzles or crossword puzzles in your life and that was your thing to do. That was my thing to do. Basically the passion, definitely, and yes. that's what got Apple throughout the but, years. Yeah, and I was very lucky to have access to information that wasn't normally in the schools. I discovered it by accident. My father had transistors. Other people would get me chips if I needed. Um, I was very, very lucky to have parts available, and that's important to the young people too. You can buy kits to teach electronics or teach computers. You can buy a little board called the Raspberry Pi that really is designed to teach people all about how computers work. Young people, it's very inexpensive. $25 or $30 for the Raspberry Pi. And, um, and, it, and, it, and it's, it, it's so in, inexpensive. But the trouble is you really need a lot of extra little things, some wiring, some motors, some pieces you can hook onto it to make it do useful things. You really need these one step at a time from a young age on to really grow up and be the expert that's going to build the computers of the future. Well, um, we would for definitely that's a very, very interesting um, discussion or story to hear. And definitely we've got lots of things to learn. However, we will be taking a very short break of 10 minutes. Uh, and I would like to encourage each and every one of you who would want to ask Waz a question to start writing it down and to hand it to us. Uh, in uh, about an hour from now, uh, and then we'll take it onward to the Q&A, which will be the last session. So 10 minutes break, please, and we'll get back to you. Yeah, and I assure you, we'll get through some Apple development history, different versions of computers, evolution of the industry to the products we have today. Absolutely. And I have to start with a personal story, which I have just told you about, and it's me and my partner, Samil Awadi, please rise. Well, we have started a small company in 2003. We have developed the first mobile app, and we did not have a payment gateway. We didn't know where to sell the application, and it was the first mobile app in Kuwait. Basically, it was Kot Busitta. Nobody believed in us. And we had to knock doors. We had to convince Tilcos. We were successful with the first application with one of the telcos and then the rest. However, then the second application didn't really make it not operational. We were successful in making it operational. And Jasim Renizi is here. He was part of the team as well. However, it never made it to the market. And we were so frustrated. And you, can you guess what kind of an application was it that didn't really make it to the market back then? It was 10 years ago. It's the WhatsApp of today. But it was built on Bluetooth connectivity and not internet because mobiles back then did not have internet connectivity. It was only because we did not have a window to the world, we could not sell it. It was a single decision that was made by a single person who judged our application and said, no, this is not going to work for the market. When the App Store comes, as I call it and as, as I described it to you, just like we say it's freedom of speech, it's now freedom of creativity. Just what's, be what's creative. Really, what's really been happening in recent times, and especially all the apps that are changing our life so much, is that they almost all, um, they wouldn't make sense as a program on their own. Tied into the internet and the information of the world and the databases of the world is really what makes them have the value. And you know, and we, we kind of stumbled into this by accident. If you think about it, the first iPhone didn't even have an app store. But I want to go through some of the evolution of Apple Computer itself. We started the company believing that we were young kids, we were going to change the world, we were going to bring technology to people, and that was good. We actually had a very incorrect, dim, fuzzy vision of how the technology would be used. Nothing like today, where it's become such an important part in our life, but nothing even like what was really going to happen in the very near future. We started out thinking, once you have your own computer at home, you can program it yourself to solve problems. 
or you can run games, or you can balance your checkbook, or you can store recipes. These are normal things that every home does. And we thought that was the world of computing. And really, that was lack of, we really had very little soft foresight. Almost every step in Apple's evolution and in the evolution of personal computers, things came about that you never expected it was going to really go that way. Um, now, we were successful with our introduction of the product because people had never imagined a device called a computer in their home before. And Apple had the formula that was right. The looks, the style, the abilities, it had color and graphics and it could play games. And it was far over any other low cost computer you could see in those days. So we kind of took over the world and became number one and every country in the world duplicated this product. The Apple II was gonna be all of the revenues of the company for the first 10 years. When you have a very successful product, a home run, and you know it, that, that buys you a lot of time to have failures. But we were, we were not intended to stop where we started. We were constantly worried, especially Steve Jobs. He was the greatest driver and thinker. He wanted to go to a, a higher intellectual level. Since he wasn't the designer of the products, he wanted to think about them deeply. What did they really mean to humanity and society? And turns out that a computer didn't mean a microprocessor, it didn't mean a certain speed, it didn't mean number of pixels. What a computer meant to a person was getting something done in their, their life. It was a tool that got them there, but what they really wanted was the thing done. And every time you can strip away the layers of technology and hide them from people, that was going to be good in, in Apple's mind. Yes, we had to sell a lot of technology along the way, but every step of our evolution, we made it simpler and more like what a human has learned and done their entire lives. It just takes time for these things to become affordable. Um, after, so our, that was our mission, and sure enough, we were sensitive to the market. We were not, although we started with a great product design and some great engineering, that's not gonna drive a company. It's understanding the buyers thinking like a buyer, being a buyer, knowing what they want, what has value, what is worth how much money. And this is marketing. We were a marketing-driven company from day one. Our funder and investor ran marketing, and he defined it that way. He was a mentor, an older person that was going to mentor Steve Jobs and myself. We were very young, and we needed learning. He taught us what kind of positions you hire in a computer company what their roles were, what their responsibilities were. He told us that Steve Jobs' responsibility wasn't clearly defined. Steve would just do anything in any part of the company and learn how to do everything, learn how to run every division, because he had confidence in Steve's um, strong drive and passion to do that. Me, I was clear. I would run engineering because I did it so well and wanted to do it for life. So we were a marketing-driven company that understood the market, and when it seemed, we started out at first, there were a lot of games that were selling our Apple II computers. And then all of a sudden, the first killer app came out. Software that made a difference. It was the spreadsheet program. It was called Visical. It let a small businessman that has his own small business, he'd go into a computer store and set up categories of income and expenses. January, February, March, April, all the way to December. And he could type numbers in, make little changements in his forecast, and instantly see the results at the end of a year. That would have taken 10 years with pencil and paper. So they started buying our computers in mass. We became a hugely successful company. We had a public stock offering. We made a lot of money. We got very wealthy. And it was really a business market it was so important. But Apple was so early in the game. We, we were able to shift our direction and head towards this business market very strongly. Capable software of doing business memos, word processing it was called, so you could type documents into a computer and print them in high quality. We went into, we eventually got into graphics, so you could lay things out that had pictures in them. Um, you know, and we, we had the spreadsheets, you could run the calculations for a department in a company and databases, databases where you could store sets of information. We even had databases that could run our own computer sales. Not, not the whole company of Apple Computer, but in individual retail stores that were selling our products. Um, these, were, these were business oriented stuff. So we became more focused on the business market.
Steve Jobs was always worried. You've got to worry about competition. If you don't move and design the next thing, somebody's going to catch up to you and design the same thing you have for the same price. And that's not a fun place to be. So Steve was always worried about big, huge companies like IBM with a lot of money taking over from us. And um, the first thing we built was the Apple III computer, after the Apple II. It's before this one. This is the Macintosh. This will come next. But the Apple III computer was a business version of the Apple II. It had problems on day one. The hardware failed. Everybody who bought an Apple III had to bring it back to the store and give up on it. It got a bad name. When you introduce a new product and it gets a bad name, my experience from the Apple III says, rename it. Call it the Apple IV, give it different abilities, make it look like something different. You can reintroduce it as the good product that works a year later, but don't keep the name that's already tainted bad. So the Apple III never made any money for Apple. It cost us maybe a billion of today's dollars, depending whose numbers you believe. My, my numbers are a billion dollars of today's. So it was a very costly experiment. It was a failure. Steve Jobs, however, by the way, he was doing really good things. He was the one that was convincing the world of how these computers were going to lead us to the future. He was out there on the magazine covers. He was speaking about it. He believed in it. It came from his heart. He was able to convince people why a computer would help me get further in life. So marketing of the Apple II was Steve Jobs' incredible strength. But he failed with the Apple III. And then came the Lisa computer. We tried to make computers easy, easy. Before the Macintosh computer, you had to type arrow keys to move cursors one letter at a time, right or left, or up and down. That's how you had to move things around on a screen. But the human eye sees things in two dimensions on a video screen. Two dimensions, and it can very quickly point to anything you see. I could point to any person here in the audience. So that's what the mouse let us do. Let us point and do things in a more human, visible way. Things made more sense to the human mind. It made life easier. It made things easier to figure out without learning a lot of instructions. You used to have to learn how to type a lot of strange commands to copy files and move files in a computer. Who wants to know about files, for one thing? But I, I just want to see a little picture on a screen that represents a photograph, maybe or it represents a document I'm doing for work. And I can just drag it and drop it in a little folder, just like I would drop a piece of paper in a folder. That was the beauty of, of this machine. Well, we, we had some fault, we faltered there. We were driven to make computing easier this way, but our first computer cost $10,000, $20,000 today. Too expensive for a personal computer. Normal people like myself aren't going to buy a computer for $20,000 that you sit at and use a mouse when you can do all the work you need to do with the Apple II for you know, $1,000 or $2,000, much less expensive. So, it wasn't, so the Lisa computer wasn't going to sell well and, um, and we were going to have to drop it as a product. Steve Jobs thought that the engineers in Lisa had failed. See, I had designed a computer at a very low cost, and it was making all the money for Apple. They had designed a computer at a very high cost. But I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth is that they designed a good computer the right way. They were good designers. And to build that computer the right way took an amount of memory that cost half the cost of the computer, just for one megabyte of memory. And memory was very expensive in those days. Now you can't even get a megabyte of memory. It's a penny, you know. It's, but back then it cost 5,000, 10,000 of today's dollars. Well, Steve didn't realize these things because he was not technical. He was not an engineer. He was not a programmer. He also didn't realize that you have to build hardware in a way that many programs can be running at the same time. And they cannot interfere with each other. There are operating system methods to do that. But Steve was never trained in computer um, architecture, software, and hardware like these brilliant people we hired from the East Coast and the West Coast. And we hired academicians, teachers that actually knew how computers should work with humans. We built a beautiful computer called the Lisa, but it was too expensive. So Steve Jobs came over to the Macintosh group that I was working on, and he took over the project. And his idea was to build a low-cost Lisa computer, a low-cost computer with the mouse and the menus. The trouble is, it was a very weak computer. 
because Steve didn't understand what you needed to make computers the right way. It was a program more than an operating system. A program to look like a mouse cursors, some menus you could click on.